Hey everybody, Dan here. Let me tell you about a new app called Poker Chill. So first, before I even tell you about it, just know this, the first five hours of play are totally free. Five free hours of play. Just log in with promo code HOOPBALL, H-O-O-P-B-A-L-L. Poker Chill lets you play poker with your friends with built-in video chat. No more computers or second monitors to try to get your poker on. It's a perfect way to hang out remotely on a Friday night with your buds. It's as fun and real as live poker, but it's on your phone. You can play from anywhere. Your couch, a chair, lying on the floor on your stomach. It's high-quality video chat right in the game, and it's easy. Just three taps to set up for beginners. It's got custom controls for more advanced games if that's your thing. It's available on iPhone and iPad right now, web and Android coming soon. That's right around the corner. So get started now. Download the Poker Chill app. Start playing. Remember, first five hours. Five stinking hours. Totally free. Just log in with promo code HOOPBALL, H-O-O-P-B-A-L-L. Poker Chill. That's the app. Check it out. You're going to love it. Stand by for a mission critical announcement. Frank LaRose is on a mission. He's on a mission to secure Ohio's elections and protect the integrity of your vote. Accomplishing the mission is what Frank LaRose does. On the battlefield in Iraq and Kosovo, he earned a Bronze Star as a Green Beret. On his mission to secure our elections, Frank LaRose made Ohio's voter ID laws some of the toughest in the country. He banned unsecured drop boxes, made sure only legal citizens can vote, and removed thousands of deceased voters and duplicate records from the rolls. With fraud, foreign interference, and Nancy Pelosi's Washington overreach threatening our state's election integrity, Ohio needs Frank LaRose. Secure our elections. Protect your vote. That's the mission, and Frank LaRose will get it done as Secretary of State. This has been a mission-critical announcement. Paid for by Americans for a Secure Elections PAC. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. I know this doesn't make any sense, but it actually feels longer between Friday and Monday shows in the fantasy offseason. There's something in my mind, I believe, where when I'm actively checking a roster all weekend long and I'm doing my ads and I'm doing my drops, it feels like... You know, some of that is going into a show, even if said show doesn't actually exist. I know the actual time between episodes is is 100% the same, but for whatever reason, it just feels like a long time since Friday. Maybe it's because, and I don't think I mentioned this on the show already, but uh, my wife had, had COVID, um, so we were all piecemealing. I, we live in a two-bedroom apartment in West L.A., and somehow, this is like nine, ten days ago now, we separated ourselves, we did all the things, and it seems like nobody got it, which is just ridiculous. But also, uh, I haven't really been able to get to my computer as often as I'd like, because all we've talked about this on the show before. My office is my bedroom. My bedroom is my office. It's also the germ room these days. But we're trying to get back to uh, to normalcy here, it seems like. I don't know, knock on something as we're going through it, uh, getting back into the swing of things. And so that might be another reason that it feels like it's been a long time because I just sort of haven't been at my work computer in like a week and a half, but for a few things here and there. And I mean, I did the shows on it, but anyway, welcome to the show, everybody. Happy Monday to you all. Fantasy NBA Today is the name of the program. I am Dan Bespris. Still, even after all this time, I remain... Dan Bespris. You can find me on Twitter at Dan Bespris. This is a Sports Ethos presentation at Ethos Fantasy BK on Twitter, sportsethos.com. Shout out at the beginning of the program, as always, to my good friend Joe Orico doing Fantasy MLB today. You guys got to check that podcast out. Do me that solid. If you play Fantasy Baseball, go check out Fantasy MLB today. You know, I'm, we're doing it here, Fantasy NBA today, but 
Baseball exists. I know it's sort of, uh, it's a different beast. And for me personally, I have a lot of trouble going straight from fantasy basketball into fantasy baseball. My brain just sort of needs a, like a, a, some time off at the end of the grind of an NBA season. But for many of you, I know you do both. And Joe's putting out terrific content over on the Fantasy MLB channel. So you can Google search that, Fantasy MLB Today. Go check it out. Get some cool baseball stuff. Get the information you need. He also does some good stuff on Twitter. And I wanted to give him a shout out at the beginning of today's show. I want to drive all of you guys to that show. And then he can drive all of you back to me when uh, a basketball loops back around. Although, of course, if you want to keep listening to this one in the offseason, you know I will appreciate that. I also want that. I want a lot of things. I want so many things. um, I don't know how I get all of them. Anyway, let's talk a little bit of playoffs, and then we're going to dive into lesson learned number five here on show number six of the offseason. Since the last time we did a podcast, that was on Friday morning, the... Well, let's see. Were there play-in games on Friday? I think there were, right? Yeah, we had the 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 secondary play in games. Atlanta won theirs. They beat Cleveland in a comeback. New Orleans beat the Clippers because Paul George. We did get to talk about that. Paul George ended up in COVID protocols, and we know them well over here. And since then, a lot of stuff has happened. But the one overarching theme has been a lot of unders. Not as many as you'd think on Saturday. Utah-Dallas was a big-time under, but Minnesota-Memphis went over. Toronto-Philly actually went way over, and then Denver-Golden State went over by a little bit as well. So it was actually only one under on Saturday, but all four games yesterday went under the posted total. Atlanta-Miami, Boston... Actually, Boston-Brooklyn went under the original total, but it went over the final number. Chicago-Milwaukee went under by... uh, 100 <laughs> and Philly or Phoenix, New Orleans also went under as well. Uh, so you could say one and three on Sunday if you want to talk about closing line versus opening line. But this is something that I want us to focus on because the game to game stuff is a little bit convoluted. And we'll talk about the three games coming up tonight. But the one thing that you really want to take away when you watch these playoff games from a gambling standpoint is what happened in the previous game and what easy adjustments are there for teams on which teams side of the ball. That's why the zigzag theory doesn't make any sense anymore. It may have worked 20, 30 years ago, whatever it was. By the way, the zigzag theory in sports betting suggests that you just basically fade whatever you saw happen the previous game in a postseason series, and you expect things to kind of bounce back and forth a little bit, which doesn't necessarily mean you bet on the, uh, the team that didn't win or the team that didn't cover. You just sort of bet against what you saw. And for instance, tonight, you got Toronto-Philly Game 2, Utah-Dallas Game 2, Denver-Golden State Game 2. Those are all happening tonight. Those teams played on Saturday, not surprisingly. Playoffs tend to go either every other day or every three days. They drag out. I know I'm kind of... I know this is... Whatever. I don't need to go on a diatribe about how long the NBA playoffs take. They're crazy long. I don't even remember who the hell started it by the time these things are over. But... For instance, Utah-Dallas, you got this grinder of a ba- of a basketball game where the teams kind of went back and forth a little bit. Dallas led early. Utah picked up the pace a little, not in actual speed, but started hitting some shots. Neither team could hit jumpers for the most part in that game on Saturday, other than Reggie Bullock, really. Pretty much everybody else missed their shot. Oh, and Boyan Bogdanovich on the Utah side. So, like, two guys could actually hit a jump shot on Saturday. It was the early game, and then coaching staffs were looking at each other like, I think the quotes after the game were about how neither team really wants this thing to be a fast-paced ball game, and that's only kind of true. Utah does like to spread things out and fire from downtown. Like, they'll, they'll play a little bit quicker. Not a fast team, necessarily, but they'll they'll get the shot up, and they'll take the three ball early in the shot clock. And then on the Dallas side, they do want to win with their defense. So the fact that this is a low-scoring game actually probably was a bit more to Dallas's side. But what I want us all looking at, when we look at totals and how you're trying to gauge what's going to happen in Game 2, I thought that this was the game where Dallas had a chance to kind of steal it. 
even without Luka, who remains, by the way, doubtful for their next one tonight. I said I thought we might see him by like game four or five in this series, and I stick by that. Calf injuries are two weeks or more. And we're just over a week out from his right now. So I think he misses probably two more games, at least. In any event, as you look at the numbers here, you want to try to say, okay, well, what adjustments are the teams going to make? On the Dallas side, you know they're going to try some other stuff on offense. Utah, to their end, won their defensive battle. And everybody made a big stink about how the Mavs weren't taking it to the rim. Mavs don't really take it to the rim. That's not their offensive game, and it it isn't even when Luka's around. Dwight Powell is kind of the only guy that gets anywhere near the bucket, for the most part, on offense. They'll try to get fouled. They'll do some driving. Spencer Dinwiddie had some issues at the free throw line. So there are a few things that you kind of have to adjust for as you look at the next ballgame. For one, turnovers were actually relatively low in this game. The shooting was terrible. The shot making was horrible. But from an actual, like from an offensive efficiency standpoint, there were actually things that could have been worse for the two teams. I know this sounds nuts. If you start with the Utah side, 14 turnovers, that's, you know, average-ish, something to that end. But they made 87% of their free throws. They made most of them. So they, they were good at the foul line. They had 23 attempts, which was fine, kind of sort of middling in number of free throw attempts. And because of that, the expected score for Utah, if you just sort of run fuzzy numbers a little bit on this thing, is actually not, I want to say, it's not that far away from where they ended up. Like, you'd see 99 and think, oh my goodness, like, they were way under the mark. But really, like, the expected score for Utah in this game, based on pace alone, was like 108. 108, 109. So yes, they went under, but they only went under by like four possessions because of bad shooting. But because they had a ton of rebounds, some offensive, turnovers weren't that crazy high, and they made their free throws... It could have actually been worse. Yes, it could have been better as well, but it could have been worse. So it's not that crazy to see Utah at 99. The Dallas side, they attempted 34 free throws. So that's another number that if you remove some of that, it actually could have been worse. Only seven turnovers for Dallas. It actually could have been worse. So Dallas at 93 points in this ballgame. If again, if you're just looking at pace alone, their expected total was only around 100. Like they just weren't expected to score that many points. I know they shot the ball terribly, but the low turnovers and the high free throw count made up for that to some degree. So the expected total in this ballgame was about 210. And yes, obviously, combined because both teams were going under their, their mark, So the line of 208 was actually right on the money. Now you have to look at game two. How does that translate over? Well, the total in this one came down to 206. Typically, playoff series actually slow down as they go. I don't know if this game could have gone much slower than it did. Friends, life can be a bit exhausting sometimes. You got work, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 60 hours a week. You've got responsibilities. Got to get your car fixed. Got to take care of the dog. You got kids. Heck, maybe even sometimes you might take a moment for your own hobby. Maybe you play a little golf. Maybe you like going to the gym. Maybe you play tennis. I don't know. Maybe you just play video games and watch TV. But the energy to do all of those, all of that, that ridiculous laundry list, can be a bit much sometimes. That's why I take M Drive Start. M Drive Start is a premium protein powder packed with seven clinically tested ingredients that support energy, strength, and drive, and six premium protein sources for optimal recovery and digestion. That one, that last one, very important for some. Every year it becomes more obvious that we're getting older. I'm very rickety when I go to bed at night and when I wake up in the morning. But that doesn't necessarily mean we need to slow down. Prioritize the need 
to take care of your health. So get M Drive Start at mdriveformen.com and use the coupon code HOOPBALL, yes, our old name, H-O-O-P-B-A-L-L for 20% off your first order of M Drive. You get free shipping and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Again, get M Drive Start at mdriveformen.com with coupon code HOOPBALL for 20% off your first order, free shipping, and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Guys, we are... So pumped to introduce some of our new friends, Vincero Collective. If you don't know Vincero yet, they're a premium lifestyle brand out of San Diego carrying watches, sunglasses, and more. Perfect for men or women of any style. Why does Dan, why do I love Vincero? They're modern. They're ethical. With the goal of crafting premium lifestyle accessories for those devoted to growth in any and all aspects of life. Health, wealth, community, whatever. Visit VinceroCollective.com slash HoopBall to get a special 15% off and free shipping discount just for our listeners. Again, that's VinceroCollective.com slash HoopBall. Vincero spelled V-I-N-C-E-R-O. Their products are stylish. They're of high quality. They're eye-catching. They're modern designs. The watches are stainless steel, durable silicon, and Italian marble straps. For the glasses, all lens are polarized. The frames are handcrafted. And because they know that online shopping can be frustrating, they have a five-year guarantee and a 365-day free return policy. That's nuts. But you don't even need to take my word for it. They have over 30,000 five-star reviews. They've been featured in Forbes, Business Insider, and Newsweek, just to name a few. Go to VinceroCollective.com slash HoopBall. Get your 15% off and free shipping offer now. Offensively, it could go either way. But pace-wise, 208, 210, that's probably about as slow as a game is going to go in the modern NBA. So I think the line is actually relatively close. All of that to say 206 is probably not that crazy of a line. You might look at the under again if you think the free throw numbers come down game over game, or if you think the turnover numbers go up game over game, but you kind of have to counterweight that with the idea of, hey, maybe these two teams have a slightly better shooting night from three-point range, maybe, or overall, just they hit some jumpers, and does that counterweight whatever potential slowdown you get in the free throw department? I would probably still lean ever so slightly to the under, but it's small. It's a small lean. I think this total is right on the money. And again, if you adjust for shooting up and free throws and turnovers bringing the number down, you probably expect the total to go a little bit higher than it did. Again, it was a 192 between those two teams. And probably ends somewhere in the, I don't know, 198 to 206 range. So slightly to the under, but not as much as you might think based on game one. As far as the side goes, Utah by five. You know, that's probably relatively accurate. Again, I thought, I think that was what the opening line was, or it swung that far for game one. Remember, it was Dallas by like three or four, and then it swung eight or ten points when Luka was ruled out. It's a pretty accurate line on the side. Um, Dallas has to shoot the ball better. They have to. But I think Utah does too. So that's why I think the total maybe inches a little closer to the, the posted line. I think Utah by five is a good number on the side. Toronto's losing bodies by the minute. Scotty Barnes is likely out. Gary Trent has a respiratory disease. It's not COVID, but he's probably out. And they lost their last one by 20 in a game that went sailing over the posted total. But at the same time, uh, well, first of all, Toronto's in a real tight spot. And and even before this series started, you kind of looked at it like, Toronto's getting very trendy. Remember I said that on Friday's show? Toronto, all of a sudden, I liked them the whole week, and then I started to look at numbers and how things were moving, and I thought, they, they just became really trendy. I don't think there's any value on that side anymore. And then, sure enough, they got smoked. Now, we know Matisse Thibel can't go to Canada because of vaccination status stuff, but, you know, James Harden, Joel Embiid, they didn't even play that well, and Philly just beat the pants off of Toronto in Game 1 clobbered him free throws were a big deal only three turnovers for the 76ers in game one so this is where again i think you got to look at some of the stuff around the number so 
Game two, Philly by six and a half is the line, total of 215 and a half. Game one, total was 216, Philly by four and a half. So on the Philly side, no surprise. It went up because Scotty Barnes is out because they won the first game handily. So the line is up two points. The total is down half a point, even though the first game went flying over the posted total. That has to frighten people. Also, this one opened, game two, the total opened at 221.5. It's down six points. Five or six points, depending on what book you're at. Oh, by the way, the side, I think, is actually up at seven, maybe even seven and a half in some places by the time this podcast airs. It's, it's still on the move. There's, that is a notable thing, especially the total. The side, I mean, you can put a lot of that on the, the Scotty Barnes, maybe the Gary Trent stuff, but the total, again, game one finished at 242. But you got to look at the stuff around the notes. Toronto vastly overperformed the expected pace of this ballgame. Only eight turnovers, 23 free throws, and they made most of them. They were only expected to score about 102 in this game. Philly, an even more ridiculous gap. Three turnovers, 34 free throws. Now, admittedly, Philly's going to take a ton of free throws. That's their, that's their shtick with Harden and Embiid out there. They had 18 of them. But that also means that the rest of the team had 16 of them, and they were very good. 34 free throws. They were only expected to score about 105 points in this game on pace. But they shot the ball really well, including very good three-point percentage. For Philly in this game. Ton of free throws. Super low turnovers. Does all of that magically come back to the mean in game two? No. But, again, if you're just looking at pace, this game probably should have been in the 206-207 range. That's how far over the number it went. I don't actually know what Toronto can do with Philadelphia, if they're now down Scotty Barnes and Gary Trent. And on the Philly side, the superstars could actually be better, although Tyrese Maxey and Tobias Harris played about as well as they possibly could in that game, so those two things probably come together. But the fact that this the total hasn't is, is damn close to game one is a pretty strong indicator that everybody saw what we're just talking about, which is that the pace actually wasn't that fast in this game, Teams just hit everything. Defense was not very good. I think you'll see more defense in this game. I think you'll see more missed shots. And the total's going to be a hell of a lot lower than 242. Does it stay under 215? I don't know. But man, if you could have gotten under 221 and a half at the opening line, yeah, I'd have jumped all over that. And finally, the last game for this Monday, Denver at Golden State Warriors by 7.5 total of... Seven, sorry. Warriors by seven, total of 222. That's down from 224. Opening number just shifted down ever so slightly. Warriors won the first one, uh, went over the total, 123-107. Warriors were favored by five and a half in that ball game and shot 52.5%. Denver's going to have some issues. Denver's going to have some issues with defense. That's been a problem for them throughout the season, missing a bunch of guys. It's Jokic against the world. Uh... I mean, I think this is just one where you'll you'll sort of typically see a playoff series slow down a little. But Denver was basically right on their expected uh, number at 107. That was pretty damn close to, to the pace, where the pace would put them in this ballgame. Turnovers were fine. Free throws on the Warriors' side were a bit on the high side, and their shooting was certainly on the high side. 16 three-pointers and 52.5% from the field. I mean, make of that what you will. Uh, Warriors were expected to score probably around 108, 110. So put those together. 220 is probably close to where you'd expect this number to be, and it's at 222. So at that point, you're flipping a coin. Do you think the teams shoot the ball well? Do you think the sort of extenuating circumstances, the extraneous factors, they point to an under in this ball game? Probably. I mean, you'd figure the Warriors maybe shoot a little bit worse, but I just don't know what the Nuggets can do with. Golden State, um, slightly to the under in that ball game, slightly to the under, actually probably in all three 
Although, again, the current number in Raptors Sixers tougher for me to get to that point. Uh, and Jazz Mavericks. Now, again, I think that number's right on the money. I mean, this one really could finish at like 204, 202, 204, something like that. Maybe ever so. Ah, yeah, nothing. No, nah, I don't want I can't do it. Can't do it. All right, lesson of the day. I know we went longer on playoff stuff, but we had a whole weekend that happened. So I wanted to kind of get into the uh, how you how you look at that game one to game two thing. Today's lesson is one that we talk about a lot leading up to draft day, but I wanted to repeat it here in sort of the the post mortem part of the proceedings. And so it won't be one of our longer ones because you guys have heard it a million times. But, but, lesson number five. I guess it's five. Unless we count the uh, Matt Klauser show as two lessons. I don't know, then we're splitting hairs at this point. It's lesson show number five. How about that? Overall show number six of the offseason. And the lesson of the day is draft for durability in the first three to four rounds in the first three to four rounds draft for durability now that's easier said than done because you're going to have surprises on both sides i will i was going to say you know draft the, the adp type stuff here we're talking about basically like if you just say the top 50 adps that's the key here adp i want to talk about adp uh as opposed to like where a guy went in your specific league. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to read off, uh, I think I'm going to read off 50 names, rapid fire. So just sit back, relax, and uh, let me say 50 names to you. I don't know why I'm doing it this way. Nah, screw that. We'll go, we'll go 12 at a time, or some chunk. The first round, the first 12, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, extends as far as Trey Young. I think we go back to draft day. First 12 is Jokic, Doncic, Steph, Harden, Anadokounmpo, KD, Lillard, Towns, Tatum, Embiid, AD, and Trey Young. That's the top 12. Out of those players on draft night, who would you suggest are the durable ones. Which of those players are the durable ones? You'd say Jokic is very durable. You'd say typically it was Lillard, and obviously that one got detonated here. Cat, prior to some wrist stuff, but you knew they weren't going to be tanking this year. Cat's been durable mostly. Uh, Jason Tatum, Trey Young. Could you say Doncic? Uh, maybe, but like I can't. We know he's not a first-round guy, so I have trouble putting him in this conversation anyway. So let's say Jokic, Lillard, Cat, Tatum, and Trey. Now Lillard was a disaster. I wanted to include him there because I didn't want to feel like we were ignoring someone that is typically a very durable first-rounder. And also, like these things are not 100%. Dame's a guy we've been drafting for years because of his durability, and then it just ran out. But the other names I just mentioned, the other durable first-rounders, Jokic, if we skip over Lillard now that we've established that he was a complete wreck, Jokic, Cat, Tatum, and Trey, those four guys, by totals this year, ended at 1, 3, 4, 5, and 4. Respectively, I want Tatum was right behind Trey Young. The rest of the first round, if you went for the and like Steph, it's hard to say whether he's durable or not. I mean, the Warriors were kind of in like reboot mode for a couple of seasons there. The other names on that first round list were Doncic, who we're going to ignore because he shouldn't have been drafted there in uh, any nine category league, certainly. Um, so the other names are Steph. Harden, Giannis, who actually is pretty durable, but they give him plenty of rest days. Kevin Durant, Embiid, and Anthony Davis were the other half of that first round. The guys that I don't think you'd classify as durable, even if some of them are kind of in between. Like Giannis is in between. It's mostly rest days. He'll get games off here and there. He played 68 out of 82 games this season. So, not to say that these guys are brittle, necessarily, but 
not durable. Those players finished. Joel Embiid finished at number two by total. So there's your kind of big surprise on the other side. Dude actually played 69 out of 82 ball games. Big deal. That's a big deal. Not sarcasm. That is a huge deal. Kevin Durant was number 10 in 57 ball games because he was just so damn good in the games he played that he stuck in the first round anyway. Giannis was at 12. Steph was at 13. Harden was at 14. Who the hell did I skip over? Anthony Davis was off the board somewhere. So, you know, it wasn't a mess, necessarily. And Joel Embiid uh, turned out to be a, a big hit on that side of the ledger. But, like, if you went Steph and Harden early, and I was inclined, by the way, to go Steph early this year, and, you know, his thing was one key injury the last three weeks of the season, otherwise he'd have been right up at the top. Where, again, I didn't think you can classify him as brittle, but not someone you were like, oh, yeah, he's definitely going to play a good chunk of the games this year. The rest of those guys ended up either near the end of the first round or farther back. Anthony Davis being the example went farther back. What did we learn from that? Well, the durable ones tended to be above the not durable ones other than one key issue on each side. Joel Embiid was a big hit. Damian Lillard ended up as a giant miss. What about the next chunk of players on this board, which extends from, let's see here, we got Paul George. Uh, I got to get 12 names on the board as I'm talking to you guys and try to do it without stuttering my way through a, uh, a podcast. It's Paul George, Bradley Beal, Vooch, Jimmy Butler, Demonis Sabonis, Bam Adebayo, Zach Levine, LeBron James, Donovan Mitchell, Freddie Van Fleet, Lomelo Ball, and Rudy Gobert. That's the next 12. Out of those 12, who would we generally classify as durable? And this, again, things get a little bit finicky here. I would say Beal had been pretty durable, oddly enough. Vooch. Sabonis is kind of a maybe. Adebayo. Mm, Gobert. Is that it? I don't know that I, I... I mean, we certainly can't say Paul George is durable. Jimmy Butler, definitely not durable. Zach Levine's kind of a... Uh, meh. LeBron, not at this age. Donovan Mitchell's been missing games lately. Freddie Van Fleet's been missing a ton of games. Lamella Ball, we don't have enough data, and he did miss games in his rookie season. So there just weren't that many in that group. And unfortunately, this was, this was a really hard chunk because Beal ended up missing most half of the season. Adebayo missed a couple of months, so that knocked him down the board a pretty good chunk. Now, it wasn't all a complete disaster for Bam. I think he ended up... Where was he by totals when this season was all said and done? I think it ended up not quite as awful as it could have been. He was in like the 60s or something like that. But that was a guy that was drafted on durability, and it didn't work. Bradley Beal, durability, didn't work. Honestly, not that many of these guys worked, durable or not. Paul George, not durable, disaster. Beal, durable, disaster. Vooch, durable, and fine, actually. He had an okay season. He didn't shoot the ball well, but he was number 20 by total, so he got there. Sabonis, after the trade, shut it down, and he was, again, not really, he was sort of neither. Levine, I was down, I was more down on Levine than than many folks, not for durability stuff, just because I thought... His style was going to get cramped, and uh, and it did. He was number 40, so he missed his mark there. LeBron, massive per-game production, but injured regularly. Donovan Mitchell, massive per-game production. He got dinged up a little bit. Not bad, though. He was at 68 games, so Mitchell was relatively close, at least. Freddie Van Fleet, great per-game production. Missed 16 ball games. He ended up actually pretty close to his ADP, so I guess we'll call that fine. LaMelo Ball outperformed it. He was a win. Rudy Gobert, uh, slightly above his, but he missed 15 games also. The whole list, it didn't even matter in this one. If you drafted for durability, it was fine. If you drafted not durability, it was sort of also meh. Second round, always a weird chunk. Harkens back to why we need that third round reversal, because this year you had almost no advantage going early versus late in the second round. Later second round guys are almost better. 
What about the third round? Those players were Devin Booker, Russell Westbrook, yikes. Michael Porter Jr., Julius Randle, DeAndre Ayton, Shea, Chris Paul, De'Aaron Fox, Jalen Brown, Chris Middleton, Brandon Ingram, Christian Wood. When you look at that board, who are the players you'd say, oh, I mostly trust these guys to make it through the season? Any of them? Booker, I'd say sort of. I mean, he's usually he's out a little bit here and there. I don't know that you'd say he's super durable. He tends to miss about a dozen whatever it is games. Actually, last year he only missed five. Seen before that. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll call Booker relatively durable. And he missed 14 games this year, but he was good, so he hit his mark. He was actually better than that. He played... What, 13? How many games did he miss? 13? 14? 13? Yeah, he beat his ADP. So that one worked out okay. Russ should never have been there. Michael Porter, not durable. Julius Randle, durable, but never belonged at this spot. DeAndre Ayton's been pretty durable. I'd say quite, actually. Uh, and he missed games this year for the first time, kind of, ever. Um, so he was hovering back near 60. Missed 23 games this year. Shea, you knew his shutdown risk. Chris Paul had been very durable lately. He missed time. Chris Middleton? Can we do Middleton? Is he fair? Yeah, I mean, it is relatively durable other than the kind of the one big injury, but you knew there were going to be rest games there. He was fine. Ingram, no. Christian Wood, no. So now you're getting into a group of guys where the scale changes. So that's what I, I think we need to pause and talk about here at the third round. What defines durability changes as you work your way through a draft anyway. Like, there aren't that many guys in the third round where you're thinking, second or third round, frankly, where you look at them and you're like, I think this dude is going to get me 77 games or more. In the first round, you are very much hunting someone who can get you 90% of your team's games or better. That's a critical, critical thing. Once you get to the second, third round, maybe you're starting to think, okay, I'll take... I'll take 85% or better, which is, what, like 69, 70 games, somewhere in that neck of the woods. And if that's your criteria, then maybe it does get just a, a little bit easier to create the cutoff. So Booker makes sense there. Aiton would have made sense there. Chris Paul had been doing it lately. Middleton lately, that's been fine. And those guys, to their credit, actually did generally turn out better than the kind of what if this dude misses some basketball games, guys. Michael Porter missed the season. Shea was shut down. He was sort of a, I don't even know where to classify his year because it was up and down. He ended up 62, like right there by what we're calling the Aiton being a miss. Chris Paul, despite the injury, came back quickly. So he finished up in that upper echelon, number 17 on the year by totals. Middleton was around 40, which is fine. You just want to avoid the giant misses in this neck of the woods. And let's do it just for one more group, and we'll take it through the top 50 here. So the next, the, the last 14 we'll talk about, John Morant, Drew Holiday, Rashawn Holmes, Clint Capella, Tobias Harris, Miles Turner, Anthony Edwards, John Collins, Lonzo Ball, Zion, yikes, Kristaps Porzingis, OG Ananobi, CJ McCollum, and JJJ. Um, Ja was a success despite sort of the typical, you know, he's going to miss a few games here and there. Um, where did Morant actually finish this season by totals? I don't think it's as high as most. Yeah. Uh, oh, he missed more games than I realized. He missed 24 games this year. Oh, right. Yeah. There was the stuff in the middle. So he was down at 75. So no. And he, you know, we, he hadn't been someone who had been healthy through full seasons yet so far. Drew Holiday coming off the championship run kind of faded him a little bit, and then he ended up being fine, 68 out of 72 games. So that was solid. Rashawn Holmes, everything fell apart. It's hard to classify his season based on a durability standpoint. Clint Capella had not been particularly durable, which not this season, but the previous season when he was getting drafted at like 70, fine, you know, sixth rounder, but... Now that he's going earlier again, it became a trouble spot. Tobias Harris, generally pretty damn durable. 
Uh, I mean, he was fine. He played 74 out of 82 games. He wasn't great this year, but he finished at 41 by totals. So there you go again. Miles Turner, not durable. Anthony Edwards looks very durable. At a glance here, seems like he's going to play through a lot of stuff. John Collins hadn't really been too durable. Lonzo, no. Zion, no. Kristaps, no. Although, again, now that you're getting into the fifth round here, you start to think, well, like, do I go for the monster per game upside? But anyway, OG Ananobi, no. CJ McCollum, yes, other than last year, so I don't know. And then JJJ, they really hadn't had any reason to push him, but he showed himself to be quite durable this season, so I think you can probably start to make a little tweak on that one. And basically, if that's what you're looking at in the top 50, the durable players, the ones that you look at and you're like, this is someone who has... And I know what you guys are thinking. You're like, you can't specifically say whether someone's going to make it through a season or not. And you're right. You're right. I think uh, our buddy Josh Lloyd says, someone's durable until they're not, or they're healthy until they're not, they're injury prone until they're not. And that's correct. But there is a subtlety to it. There are percentages at play here where someone who historically has been a guy who just sort of, like the guy that doesn't get the little ankle tweaks or the little calf tweaks or whatever, some of that is biology. Some of that is how they play on the floor. We know Patrick Beverly is going to miss a third of the games every year because he just gets dinged up the way he plays on the floor. We know Christoph Porzingis is like a woolly mammoth out there. I like to call him a unicorn, but unicorns aren't real. Woolly mammoths existed, but they were just too big. They were too big for their own good. There are parts of Christoph Porzingis that are just not the right shape for a regular human being. His body is like too large in spots. He's too tall or his knees can't support. Like, there's a reality here also to certain guys, maybe not as many. That's the thing, I think. Like, we like to put the tag injury prone on a lot of guys, and it's probably too many. Or we like to call a lot of guys durable. And again, it's probably too many. The real number is less on both sides, but there is a reality to it. And if you're saying, is history a predictor of future, the answer is, yeah, sort of. Someone could be healthy, and then one year they might just not be. But if someone is is a player that's typically healthy, they have a higher chance of still being that guy the next time around. It's not 100%. Nothing's 100%. But when you look at a player like, oh, I don't know, Bam Adebayo, he'd been so durable, and then he had the one big elbow thing this year that knocked him out for a while. And then, he, again, he played. I don't know that that changes whether or not we're like, okay, is this a durable player? Jason Tatum is someone who had been durable. We talked about it in the first round. When we picked those five or six guys that are typically durable, only one of them didn't then have a durable season. And on the other side, when you look at the players that weren't, only one then did kind of surprise and play through most of the season. So the surprises exist, but they are smaller than the things that go the way you expect them to. If you thought Devin Booker was going to play in 85% of his team's games or more, he did, basically. If you thought, looking at, you know, guys that are beat up a little bit more, like Kristaps Porzingis, if you thought he was going to miss 15 to 20 ball games or more, he did. These things, they are, I don't want to call them predictable, because that makes it sound like we can get them all right. But there is a predictive value to studying a player's history even if it's maybe not as big as some would like you to, to think, and it's also not as small as some would like you to think. It's in between. Like the original kitten mittens. It's not big, it's not small, it's in between. Your cat is in between. And the reason I bring this up again as the lesson of the day is these players, 
that you're spending so much draft capital on them. And if they play, and I get it. I like I understand that Nikola Jokic is single-handedly winning basketball leagues, Roto in particular. But if you had Cat in the first round and you had who was someone in the second round that actually made it through most of the season, if you had like LaMelo Ball in the second round, you actually stood a decent chance to compete with the Jokic team, depending on who that guy got in the second round also. Or if you had, I don't know, Vooch as your second rounder, you were competitive. If Chris Paul was your third rounder, you were competitive. If Devin Booker was your third rounder, you were competitive in a way that if you took a big swing on someone and it didn't work out, you wouldn't be. Now, the fact that the second round was just a complete cluster mess this year does clutter up the analysis a little bit on this. But I think the first round is maybe more than enough for us to kind of see what we see. Put your chips on a player that you think is going to get you 75 games in that first round. If you can do it again in the second, awesome. If that player doesn't exist, okay, well, you know, we make our adjustment. But those first three rounds in particular... Gun for guys that are going to get you 74 games or more. Call it 90% hit rate. And your team will be just fine. Back tomorrow. Lesson number six around the corner here on Fantasy NBA Today. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk playoffs again tomorrow as well. I'm Dan Bespris. Have a great Monday. On to the next one. Virginia is for families, all sorts of families. My family, your family, your neighbor's family. For families of all species. For beach chair sitting families and paddleboard standing families. For families that like to camp outside and the ones that would rather museum inside. Yep, we got plenty of those to choose from. For mountain hiking families and would rather hang out by the pool resort going families. Come to think of it, that's more my speed. So, in conclusion, Virginia has all sorts of things your family could love. So, come love it for yourself. Underdog Fantasy is the fastest-growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO, and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100? Get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply.